hey, it's Mr. Nobody to you, pal. And don't you forget it. Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. Um, you know, I will accept Sir Nobody as well, so that's that's okay. Um, you know, speaking of Nobody, that's our movie today, and we have with us screenwriter Derek Kolstad for the Q&A, and man, this was a fun one. You know, it's been a hot minute. We haven't had Derek in the series since John Wick 2, and I'm so glad to have him back because I thoroughly enjoyed Nobody. It's, it's, it's a fun film and you know it's it's violent but the violence is cartoonish and absurd kind of like the world that nobody the character in the film is fighting against and it was interesting my 11 year old daughter who would not watch Godzilla versus Kong with me um you know because she was worried about all the people getting hurt as collateral damage in the different buildings she uh she was very excited to see this movie based on the trailer because who doesn't want to see a movie about a dad kicking ass because someone has stolen his daughter's kitty cat bracelet. I mean, that's heroism right there when a guy goes after somebody to get the bracelet back. Um, you know, but she she was thoroughly entertained by it. My wife, who really basically opts out of almost any movie I'm going to watch because she says it's either too violent or too scary. She sat down and watched it because she was curious and she absolutely loved it. I, I thought it was a fun movie. Um, Derek has a way in his writing of creating these unique worlds and these quirky characters that inhabit the world. And everybody is on a, a justified track toward revenge, at least in their own minds always. And uh, look, it's a lot of fun. I hope, I hope you check it out because uh, I think you too will be entertained as well. And as for our Q&A, Derek was very forthcoming about what it took to get this film made that he's been trying to make for the last five years. Um, and so I know you'll dig this podcast. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You can read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. Go figure. That's what it's called. And uh, look, folks, there's a lot of cool stuff to explore. And we are working really hard on our Oscar issue, which is going to be coming out soon. So we would love to have you as a subscriber. If you've never read us before, you could check out our free issue over at Backstory.net. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a full issue. So you'll know what we're about. And hopefully you'll then decide that you want to subscribe. And if you do, we would love to have you, so I'm going to offer you a discount coupon code. It is SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five. You could enter that in the checkout cart at Backstory.net, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription and give you access to our archive, which goes back to about issue 29. And we're, we're building to put in more issues in there as well, but we're also working on our new issue right now, and that has to take precedent over everything else. But uh, look, there's a lot to explore in Backstory, so I hope you check it out because I would really appreciate having my podcast listeners and the Backstory Magazine YouTube watchers because remember, we're putting all these Zoom podcasts up on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. I would really appreciate having all of you join me as subscribers for my passion project, Backstory Magazine. Look, when it comes to seeing nobody, don't forget, kids, you could go see this anywhere that you've been renting movies online during this old pandemic. So you could rent it in iTunes, you could rent it on Amazon, you could uh, probably watch it on demand as well through your local cable box. So go see Nobody. I think you're really going to enjoy it. And now without any further ado, let's jump right into our Q&A with screenwriter Derek Kolstad about his latest film, Nobody. Derek, it's good to see you. How you doing, man? Good, man. I mean, outside of the COVID of it all and us all kind of clawing at the walls and really tired of the home office, um, it's crazy pants right now. I mean, we talked about this a little bit, but right, you know, when you to reiterate, uh, Falcon Winter Soldier and nobody are opening within a week or two of each other. And that was never supposed to be the case. So uh, it's crazy pants. <laughs> I, I think it's wild. And it's got to be fun for you to have like all that action happening at once. Uh, I think that's I think that's really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to go back for a second before we get to today's film. Nobody. Um, it's always fun to ask just because the last time you were in the screening series, you remember those things when you could go to movie theaters and talk in front of people yeah. and we were all doing that together. Yeah. You were, you were there for John wick too. And it was really a blast of a Q and a with a full house, you know, sold out. We turned people away at the door and um, it was, it was a fun Q and a, and I'm curious now looking back a few years later, what do you think your biggest lesson was on, on, on John wick too? something that you couldn't have really seen at the time, but just something that in your oeuvre and your creative process, 
something that you maybe picked up on John Wick 2 or a lesson that you learned that you've kind of carried forward? You know, from a, from a production standpoint and from a story standpoint, you know, one of the things I've, I've always said lately when I do these pitches on other projects is like the way into any television show or franchise or game, I love saving Private Ryan, but the best way in is uh, Hell is for Heroes, right? You're in a trench, you're taking out one, uh, you know, machine gun nest, right? And everything else is taking place in the background. And you have this intimacy of character. And what was so cool about John Wick 2 is it was our gauntlet, a la Clint Eastwood. You know, it was our game of death. And to get there, it was going through a dozen other ideas, you know, a couple other scripts. And then the other thing, too, is when John Wick 2 came out, it was never a sense of, from, you know, talking from my standpoint of like, oh, I've made it now, or any sense of impending grandeur or whatever you might call it. But it was always like, huh, cool. And yet, you know, I was reminded time and time again, it was around that time that I, I first got to know Bob Odenkirk and we first talked nobody. When you think we, our first meeting was five years ago, which wow. seems like a lifetime, but it's a couple of weeks, you know, that's the weird life thing. And one of the things that he said to me in that first movie, I mean, that first meeting was Derek, the best thing that ever happened to me was becoming famous later in life. And, uh, I took that to heart, you know, uh, and, you know, being 40 when your first theatrical movie comes out and now being 46, 47 in a week or two and be at the stage, I think it was just, it wasn't a hard reset. It was a little bit of a 3% perspective shift of going like, okay, cool. You're, you're okay, man. You know, like just focus and, you know, remember and realize, uh, you didn't do this alone. And, uh, to lean in when you can't do it alone, you know? I think that's sound advice. John Wick 2 is well-received, and the the franchise is moving forward, and it's it's been reported lately, unfortunately, that you're not going to be joining the other um, the other stuff that's going on. Of You know, you, you co-wrote on John Wick 3, and John Wick 4 and 5 is going gonna, is gonna to move forward without you, and then, obviously, there's going to be a TV show of the Continental, and... I, I'm sure it must be tough and I don't want to put you into any sort of imposition to talk about it, but I'm just curious what advice you would have for other writers, because it's, it's a blessing and a curse to create something like that, that the world loves um, in which you give up your IP technically when you sell your screenplay, but yeah. your name because of WGA protections will always be associated with it. They won't be ripping you off like they might've in the old days in which you'll, you'll always see a revenue stream which could you know give you the impetus to pursue other creative projects as well and who knows maybe one day they they will have you back for something so i'm just curious like do you think that there's any sort of a teaching moment from from something like this or 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 what your experience has been and what you expect it to be going forward just just you know watching from a distance you know it, you begin you begin in this trade in the trenches alongside a number of people. And at a certain point, uh, you're a part of building a machine. And once, if that machine becomes successful, um, you watch as it, as it roars off. And to me, since the age of 12, I wanted to write movies, man. You know, I, I, that's what I wanted to do. It took fucking forever. But uh, John Wick gave me that opportunity. So to everyone involved in that production and that endeavor, um, they were the gateway to where I am now. So in that respect, I'll always be, uh, you know, grateful and gracious. And hopefully, uh, you know, you think of the, 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 uh, the ability to pay back in full, like I see what's happening with John Wick four or five in the continental and I'm going to be first in line, man. And uh, I know some of the other writers involved. Uh, of course, I can't speak highly enough in Chad and uh, uh, Keanu. And uh, I can't see, wait to see what they do with this. Because come the end of it, uh, no matter where this thing goes and how it might evolve, um, dude, you know, the, the seed was planted by me. And it will, the garden was tended to by them. And so, look, man, it, you, could, you could lean into the negative of these things. But the positive is... Uh, I made that thing and that thing is letting me make other things. 
And as you know, uh, Lance Reddick always says, uh, Derek, I just want to do cool shit. And That's awesome. John Wick has allowed me to do a lot of cool shit. So, and I, and I can't wait to see what you do next. And, and I really actually enjoyed watching Nobody, which we're going to get to in a couple of minutes. But since you just said that you wanted to write movies since you were 12, you know, a lot of 12 year olds don't even think about the writing. They think about the directing first. And I'm curious, do you remember what the impetus was for, for that choice of yours? Was there a movie that inspired you when you maybe for the first time in your life realized, oh, yeah, movies are written. It's not yeah. just something that appears there or is improvised or is directed. It's twofold. One, the movie was Predator, you know? Oh, really? And yeah, it was the first rated movie I saw in the theater on opening night. If it bleeds, we could kill oh, it. Gosh. And what people don't remember at the time is like, first, first it was deafening. <laughs> like, and, you know, it was my best friend, Ryan Lindley and his father, Joe. And I think, I can't remember who else went. And it was just awe-inspiring. But before that, like, I always loved writing short stories. I always loved reading. I was a voracious reader. Um, and when we had short story day in class, I became known as that kid who killed off all of his friends in the short stories. Uh, but it was always like, sweet, I had a cool death in one of Derek's stories, right? And it was just fun. And then when, it was, when you saw a movie and you saw the written by, it was that magical moment of like, oh, I could marry these two things that I fucking love, right? And that's kind of where it began, you know? And when you think of the genre of it all, I've always loved action. You know, my mom and dad have always encouraged me in this. And, and in the early 80s, when a lot of those movies came out off trademark, off copyright, they were, remember, like 99 cents in the, the grocery store bin yeah, or whatever? Yeah, yeah. My mom would grab these old black and white movies and I would eat them up. Um, but I was also that kid who was scared of everything. You know, I couldn't watch PG movies. They'd, they'd scare the shit out of me. And it wasn't until we were on a road trip and my, my great uncle overheard this. And he came up to where we were staying and he said, and he handed me this giant book. And he said, Derek, if you make it through this, I won't be scared anymore. And it was a first edition hard, hard copy of It by Stephen oh, King. Oh, wow. And he was right. It scared the shit out of me, but it made me a lover of Stephen King, made me a lover even more so of writing. And that was kind of the, the gateway drug that, was, that, that formed the path, you know? You know, just for, for Stephen King fans out there, um, something cool that he's done and he just did like literally a couple of weeks ago, it came out. There's a there's a great imprint of, of books called Hard Case Crime, mm. and they've revived a lot of out of print pulps, but they've also inspired new crime thrillers. And Stephen King wrote a brand new crime thriller called Later. I haven't read it yet. Is it out? It's out. It just okay. came out. It just came no. out. Because, you know, the thing about Stephen King that I've always loved is, uh, you know, of course, the world building is phenomenal, but there are short stories that you will be walking somewhere alone, thinking about work, and you will see something and you will be flooded by that story. What's one of your faves? Uh, honestly, Jaunt. Jaunt is still one of my favorites, you know, the, the sci-fi one. Yeah. Um, because it's, it's small, but it's massive and it's intimate. And then when you look at... Um, a lot of the other ones to me there's all, like he did this one i never remember its name but i think about it daily so i need to look it up again but it's the hard uh it's like the hardcore neo-noir detective where it's revealed that the writer is replacing himself with his creation and it becomes this switcheroo and you're like it was so well done that it's impossible to pitch and hopefully i didn't you know hacksaw it too much there I, th I think, the very I think end, saying, like it's the one that's kind of like purple rose of Cairo, but on the page, right? Yes. Yes. And then what ends up happening at the very end, because the, the author has a uh, skin, uh, some kind of disease, some kind of singing detective type thing. And he successfully replaced, like switches out with his creation. Right. So the, the creation is in the apartment in real life. And because it's his creation, he sits down and starts typing. And you're just like, oh, shit, you know, but I will say the one that that made me finish reading it and uh, I couldn't sleep through the night was the way he ended Pet Cemetery. I don't know if you remember that one. He ended it by saying, yeah, I can't I can't finish it. Like, like it's a note to the reader where it's like, yeah, I'm not going to turn around. Like, because, you know, I don't his remember wife, that at all. Like he goes and he buries his wife. Yeah. And he's in the kitchen and the wife is entering the kitchen. And you're like, you turn the page and there's a, there's a note from, there's a, there's like a letter from him saying, yeah, I guys, I'm That's done. Awesome. I forgot about that. I love that. You know, 
But I mean, That's again, it. huge fan of that guy. Uh, and there's a lot of us are that you'd be surprised that uh, when I watch movies, the only genre I really keep up with is horror because God damn, it's so cathartic. <laughs> sure. When did the idea first form for nobody? You just said that like it was about five or six years ago that you even talked to Oda Kirk about it. So clearly you knew you wanted him in it. Was it something that you wrote specifically with him in mind or just your script was done and you were starting to see who you could attach? No, it was a, it was a general that came out of nowhere. Um, he and his wife had been watching cable on the road and they caught John Wick and they loved it. You know, he, you know, he was totally into it, but surprisingly uh, she really dug it too. And he had always wanted to do his, let's be honest. If I was an actor, I want to be Indiana Jones in, in James Bond. You know, I think a yeah. lot of people do. I want to be Jack Reacher. I want to be, you know, I want to play that role. And he never, he never had the opportunity to do that. And so uh, he, they called, they called me on like a Thursday, um, Braden Aftergood and Mark Provisario and I went over to his offices there on, um, in, in uh, kind of near where AFI is, you know, and uh, come in and sit down. And uh, that night I had a, a dream and it was a black and white dream about the opening scene. And I told Sonia that the next morning, she was like, yeah, you got to tell him that. And so I told him the opening scene and he looks at me, and goes, you're fucking hired. <laughs> <laughs> and, by, and by the way, I didn't know, I didn't know what, what the, uh, uh, you know, what we were meeting about yet, you know? Um, but he wanted to do something where, you know, uh, it begins the classic seventies inspired way. You bring in the world building of John Wick, but you allow him to have humor and levity and soul, which in everything I do, I want there to be humor, levity, and soul because I'm not a cynic. There are things out there that are massive in the IP world and, and film and TV that I'm just, I'm not the audience. And you'd be surprised that I'm not the audience because I am a silver lining guy, you know? You know, we're going to have a spoiler section, so I don't know if we need to save it for there. But It's not much of a spoiler, but it's, it's it, this, this, the this, this is the scene, right? So it's uh, his character, Hutch. It's, it's, a, it's a shot of him at the end of a long table, kind of done like a uh, third man or M, right? And he's just sitting there. He's beaten to shit. Oh, it's the opening of the movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we, we of course, we did a little bit different because you got time. Time is your enemy. Yes. And uh, he's looking at the camera and suddenly buy me a ticket on the airplane begins to play. We don't know the song. And it's deafening. And yet it's kind of only in his head. He reaches over his pocket. He brings out a pack of cigarettes, taps him out, oh, takes off that little plastic string, looks over and realizes these two fingers are dangling. So he's like, uh, snaps him back into place, ties him with the string, cigarette, lighter, smokes, exhales, reaching into his pocket, brings out a kitten, brings his other pocket, brings out a can of tuna, right? Other pocket brings out an opener and the kitten starts eating in front of him. And it's a, it's a notoriously short song. So it ends and there's this voice off screen that says, who the fuck are you? And that was in your dream. In your dream, there was a voice off screen. Yeah. And he said, me? Me, I'm no, and that was the title. And so you've seen in the trailer, it's 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 elemental to that. Uh, but that's where we started with. And the greatest thing about working with Bob is he's a comedian, he is an actor, he is your dad's best friend, it's your favorite uncle, but he's also an incredibly talented writer to the point that when you get notes, you look forward to them because it makes you a better writer and it makes the project a better project. And he spent much like Keanu did on the John Wicks. He spent just as much time on the secondary and tertiary characters as he did on himself, because it's one thing for a guy to enter a room going, I'm Derek Colston, I'm a badass. It's another thing for a guy to enter the room and, and, and be very kind to the dog. And you have that big guy's like, who the fuck's this? And then the character leaves and he's like, yeah, do you, do you know who that is? That's more badass, right? And he understood that. And we just got the geek out, man. That's that's awesome. See, I was going to ask that later. Was that a bookend? Was that something that they that they threw in? You know, like it was the like first it was editing, the first scene I wrote. Yeah, it was the first so. thing you wrote. I, I love it. I love it. Well, so tell me this: like uh, when you sit down to write, so you've now had this dream. How important is outlining to your process? And we've talked about this before, but I'm just curious if it's changed at all. You know, um, if I spec for me, uh, I just I, I like diving in the script. I kind of like going chaos. You know, I don't, I don't do much of an outline, but I also do a lot of scribbling. Uh, I do a lot of walking, a lot of hiking. Uh, I, I play way too much Hearthstone, which I suck at. 
um, and or civilization on the on the iPad, which I get bored at, you know. Um, but the whole time I'm thinking, you know. Um, but that's spec for me. Uh, for other things like you know, pitches are key. Uh, treatments are fun, you know. And there's a lot. I mean, treatment rewriting is the worst. But that first draft of treatment, that's key, you know. So to be able to to hand someone an 18 page treatment, going here's the whole movie. Uh, go through with your red pen and say, no, yes, add, yes, no, you know. So by the time we're all locked down on that treatment, then I can go off and sprint. Because by the time you get to script on any of these things, that's, in my experience, the least amount of work because you get to run. Now, when you start rewriting, holy Lord. But, um, you know, again, to answer your question, for me, just give me the the, the, the empty page. But for anything else that's going to be more collaborative, love the treatment. Uh, beach beach sheets. Uh, I, I, I'd rather I'd rather flesh it out a bit more. Uh, I think it's just it become it, it it has a life to its own as a treatment and leaps off the page a bit. Well, so there was no treatment for nobody. I'm guessing then, because it was not collaborative. Uh, you know what? It was a little bit of both. You know, because uh, it it was emails. It was pages. I mean, it was kind of like that kind of a bit of a a weird creature Um, because we also knew that once you have that first draft, um, then the real work begins, you know, it it was still fun, but it's work fun because the hard thing about movies like John wick and nobody. And a lot of what I do is in order to really layer out the foundations, you have a long first act, you know, and that's, what's so great about the bond movies, especially the ones with Roger Moore, right? You begin with the last action sequence for a movie that doesn't exist. Your your first, and that's the prologue. Your first act could be forty minutes, but who cares? Did you see that thing he did skiing? You know, um, and so that was always like, hey, the inciting incident doesn't happen till page thirty eight or thirty nine or forty. Now, by the time you get to editing, and uh, Evan is phenomenal, and uh, what I love about him is he sees what we're trying to do. And when I first saw when I first saw the movie. There is this sequence that's on eight pages, right? And we all loved it and didn't want to change it. And suddenly on screen, it was like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And I was like, yeah, that's much better. (laughs) Yeah, right. The opening of the movie. I was going to ask about that. It's fantastic. No, no. And that's, dude, that is Ilya. That is uh, Evan. uh, That is Kelly, Dave. I mean, that's Braden. It's a whole team. Yeah. Um, So, uh, yeah, I mean. That's what I think is great. It's, it's going back. We joked about this before. It's going back to favorite scenes in movies are usually an accident or someone in post going, guys, just do this. You're like, oh, thank God. <laughs> so how long did it take you before you kind of had these emails and a treatment that you went to your script stage? How long were you, was it? Was it percolating? It was pretty fast. Um, just because I, you know how you get involved in certain projects and you just there's an energy in the room. And, you know, that was the energy in the room. We just had a great time talking about it. And we sprinted off. And of course, we, it, was a, it was a pitch first. You know, We had pages of the script. We had treatments, all that kind of stuff. But let's, like, let's go out with it as a pitch. And uh, we pitched everybody. And there was one day we were at one of the big agencies. I don't remember which one. And we I did. I just want to clarify. It's you and Bob, right? Me and Bob. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it's, we did nine pitches back to back. After that, I just wanted to die. Bob could have gone and run a marathon, right? right. It kind of shows you the different personalities there. But ultimately, um, we kind of we set it up at STX, and they let, let it lapse. And then, um, you know, Bob, he's such a proponent of this thing since day one. We ended up, um, you know, I got a I got a, a close relationship with uh, Dave and Kelly at A Seven North, and they had signed a, a deal with it, with Universal. And they carried it over, uh, you know, the goal line. Uh, you know, it's, so. it's, it's, it's a curious thing, right? Because there was there was a heyday for pitching where writers, even without an actor attached, could pitch and get get assignments. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give you a statistical analysis because I can't remember what it was. But I, I would say it's pretty safe to say that 60 percent, at least of those scripts were coming in as junk. Yeah. Like they sold in the room. Everyone's jazzed because that's your personality, right? That's your enthusiasm. Yeah. When it was time to sit down and get that on the page, didn't always happen. And, and it made people a little shy about buying some of those pitches. But when you have yeah. an actor attached, it's a different story. So I'm, I'm actually surprised to hear that 
you know, when you were going around, Odenkirk had already done Breaking Bad. I don't think Better Call Saul had launched. So it's kind of surprising that, you know, it didn't sell in the room. But so was was the lesson there that you needed to go to script stage or was it that? You no, the, the lesson there was. I mean, it's the classic was the William Goldman of nobody knows anything. You yeah, know? of course. And uh, it was like everyone liked us. Everyone liked the idea. But it didn't fit any algorithm, you know, for, right. you know, the streamers, for the uh, international, all, all of those things. Right. And it's almost like you were bound by that equation. I mean, that's really what it came down to. And so, you know, again, it was the star power of Dave and it was it was uh, the wisdom of Kelly. And it was it was it was them becoming teammates to Braden, Mark and all the other participants and players to the point that, you know, when I visit set, my, my job should be done. That's the way I always look at it because we do so much. Right. That's something to blow up and, you know, you'll lose location and there'll be some work. But like when I went to set to see everyone who is a part of that on set all the time at two in the fucking morning in Winnipeg, when it's like negative, negative and still grinning is pretty awesome. That's you know? awesome. All right. Well, so when you sit down to write, do you give yourself a page count to hit each day or a certain amount of hours to hit each day? You know, it, it keeps shifting to be honest. Um, so on nobody, what was it? On nobody? Uh, probably four hours a day. Uh, okay. And then you, I, I, if I'm doing just writing, if if I do more than a four-hour stretch, it's going to be kind of like junk. Not junk. You know, just like, okay, I'm spent, right? And yet I like having – but then I can also go four hours in this thing and then shift to something else. for, And, and then it's like, oh, sweet. We get to play in this new sandbox, right? Um, so as much as I love the writing of things, what I'd say to most writers, <laughs> screenwriters is, uh, when this becomes a real career, the writing part of it is the smallest part of it in regards to time. Most of it is this and zooming and notes and treatments and pitches. And, you know, and again, it's all great, but at the same time, I make sure that at the end of every day for at least 10, 15 minutes, and sometimes it goes off later in the night. I open up an empty document and just say, fade in, you know, diner in Harlem in 1941. And then just write for a bit. That that becomes what I call an orphan. You know, nothing might ever come with that, but it just yeah. feels, you know. Every day you do that? Yeah. That's great. I mean, you know, Ray Bradbury was famous for, for you know, his writing every day and stuff like that. And he had this drawer full of ideas, you know, back in the analog days, obviously. Yeah. And he would, he would just pull them out and go through them sometimes. Is that something you do with some yeah. of your orphans? Not really. Um, I have certain files that I, I collect these things, but a lot of times I remember the scenes and the, and the, and the characters that I like, and I'll bring them back in other iterations. You know, my, my thing with, with writing is, and I'm sure that going back to what we talked about with Stephen King, he probably looks back at his, some of his earlier work and he's just like, man, I changed, you know, not gotten worse or, or better or like any, it's just the voice changes because you grow older, you, everyone changes. So when I, I find myself in meetings every now and then, they're like, yeah, we're looking for this kind of movie. And I was like, I expect something like that. And then you go back and read it. Like, I'm not sending that to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I think come the end of it, it's like writing just isn't the typing. You know, when you look at Falcon and you look at TV shows, the work is done in the room and it's a collaborative effort with people who are just geeking out and they're, they're, they're taking IP, they're laying the foundation, they're diving into character. And they are doing layer after layer after layer, and they're finding some way that subtext is key and that character is soul. And then by the time you're off to write the script, you're like, okay, now I get to type, you know, that's, 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 that's awesome. And we'll, and we'll make sure to talk about Falcon and winter soldier a little later as well. You know, what do you do if you get writer's block, if you get it, how do you, how do you handle it? You know, everyone gets it. And, and for myself, it's, uh, um, it's, a, it's an anxiety. And, and usually it's not, what would you call it? It's, right, it's not writer's block. It's everything else it's kind of telling you, like, uh, you cannot write. You know, you, you know, you, you're, you're the, the classic, like, you're a failure. Fuck off, Derek. Um, and I think what I do is twofold. One, I make myself write a page. And that's just typing. But there is this connection between your, your mind and your fingertips where you're like, okay, no, I can, I can write. 
And then dude, it's like when people are in the car, they're working out and they listen to their favorite song. And for me, one of the glorious aspects of YouTube is tracking down your favorite scene. You know, there are movies that I'll watch it over and over again, but you know, I think here's an example is during John Wick two, which was very tough. Um, I would go downstairs in front of an old plasma TV, right? The, the kind of rough heat. And I would turn on YouTube and I would watch the trailer for Mad Max Fury Road. And I would just, I would spread my arms out with this big fucking grin because the energy, it was like, that yeah. is the fuel, you know? So that's what I do. What are some other favorite trailers or scenes that you like other than, other than that? Uh, the opening of Point Blank with Lee Marvin. Absolutely. Um, Walking through LAX, right? Yeah. Oh, dude, yeah. The USS Indianapolis scene from Jaws. Any scene in Starship Troopers, man. Like, I've... Really? You know, yeah. oh, dude, when the bug... You know, was it Michael Ironside? Oh, Michael Ironside, right? Uh, when the bugs come over the ridge, he goes, oh. Like, stuff like that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But I'm also a big fan of, uh, of the old black and whites. So, you know, James Cagney, uh, you know, watching, you know, you know, White Heat or something like that, and you just bask in it. And, you know, I, I'm, I love humor in movies. I'm not a, a comedic writer. I think those guys are just geniuses and they're, they're, they're uh, created differently. Um, but I'll put on like any of the Howard Hawks movies or something like Harvey. And suddenly it's like going into a time machine and going like, Hey Derek, everything's okay. You know, that's, that's cool. You know, we live in a, we live in a crazy time and a, a violent society, unfortunately. And now that people are starting to come back out again after the pandemic, after quarantining a bit, as people are getting vaccinated, or I don't know what it is, but some of the crazies are coming out, unfortunately. And, yeah. you know, we just within the last week had two different uh, public massacres, yeah. you know, one in one in Atlanta and one in Boulder, Colorado. And it's it's very sad. And any time a movie is coming out that has any sort of violence connected with it, some people try and pin that on the movies, which I think is overall unfair. Um, sure. because if you, if you look into everything from the ideologies or just the, the problems that most of these shooters are having, it's, it's not coming from their media. I yeah. mean, there, there, there have been study after study and very few people you will find that it's, that it's the media's, the, the, the movies that they're consuming's fault, right? It's, 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 it's equally to, to pin, you know, catcher in the rye on 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 you know the killing of, of of john lennon and oh should it be a banned book you know was something that was talked about a lot of the time and that you know it's not really about that book exactly and you know here we are and this movie's coming out and i, I know it's tough because there's there's going to be some people that are just turned off by the violence that they see even though there's nothing like it in your movie because your movie is a very wacky and i say that lovingly wacky. i'll take it man it is a wacky and zany revenge tale yeah and I'm, I'm just curious your your thoughts about kind of you know the reality of violence versus sometimes what i would call the cartoon violence that we see in your movies which sure people could say is fetishistic but like yeah. in a much different way than than promoting it i mean like you know just the, the concept of john wick Someone kills his dog and he wants revenge yeah. and he just happens to be a fighter and he knows how to take it. But, but what, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? The, the reality of it versus, you know, cinema. The realities of tragedy like that are when it occurs, you always try to find, try to reason your way into and out of it at the same time, you know, and everyone wants to find something to blame. But I think the people that are at the forefront saying it's, your kind of movies, Derek, that are responsible are also massive fans of Star Wars and Indiana Jones and James Bond. And they're really no different than mine outside of what occurs off screen and what's on. Um, and yet, you know, when these things happen, the saddest aspect is the detachment of those involved, you know, uh, the, those who perpetrate. And, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a sadness, a sorrow there, and especially with the repetition. You know, we, we look at all of us have a cross to bear in that regards, right? Um, and yet, when it comes to the movies, like I'm 46, turned 47 in a couple of weeks. Congrats. You know, I, Happy birthday. Thanks, bud. Made it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but when you look at the, the, the generations I grew up with, it was, you know, video games that caused, caused violence. 
um, movies that cause violence. Oh yeah, I, I could remember having an argument literally with my mom about Space Invaders. Yeah, and the, and the violence of Space <laughs> Invaders and you all remember, the destruction. Like, there was this old one called Death Race that you would run down. Yeah, you know, it was old pixelated black and white, and then make a skull and crossbones. And it was like that encouraged you to run on people. And you're like, really? And then Dungeons and Dragons was a big one in the eighties. You know, when you yes. had this panic panic as like, that's a gateway drug. And it's like, is it, you know, um, you, you, for anyone that doesn't know this, look up the Tom Hanks, um, Dungeons. Oh, oh, I saw it when it was on dude. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was his, that was one of his first movies. It was a TV movie special about the dangers of Dungeons and Dragons and wow, now the name is evading me. But yes, look at look in Tom Hanks's career. I think it was called. Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember the title. Yeah. I don't want to get it wrong. But but like literally, people were that panicked about D and D that they thought that kids playing it would go as they do in the movie into an actual cave, like an actual dangerous ass cave, and do crazy stuff that's going to get other kids killed. Yeah. Well, and you look at the realities of life, and you look at the imagination of film. And you could quite easily cloister the two and say they're very different, but there are connections, you know, and yet at the same time, you know, I, I'm not a violent guy. I'm not a gun guy. I'm not an anti-gun guy. I'm not a, you know, like when you think of all these little aspects of like, oh, of course he's this. It's like, no, man, I'm a, I'm a guy who grew up with these movies that like Predator, you're chuckling the whole time because there is an absurdity to the action movie genre. And that's why we enjoy it. You know? Yeah. I mean, the more real it gets, the more you're like, man, I'm not having fun here. You know, my, my daughter's 11 and somehow in her YouTube feed, she came across a trailer for nobody. And <laughs> she sees a guy that says they stole my daughter's. What is it? A kitty cat, cat, kitty bracelet. cat bracelet. And, and, and like, she's like, Oh my God, this movie looks amazing. Can I see it? I'm like, funny, you should ask. I'm interviewing yeah. Derek tomorrow. And like a screener <laughs> just came through. Do you, are you sure you want to see it? Because a week ago, she would not watch Godzilla versus Kong with me because she started telling me that all those people in the buildings are dying and it's just too much death yeah. for her. And I'm like, this is a rated R. I will let you watch it if you want. But like, there's going to be, you know, a lot of shooting. Strangely, this girl also plays Fortnite and keeps telling me, you know, and I play with her sometimes. And she keeps telling me about the community is fun for Fortnite. I'm like, community? It's a battle royale. <laughs> There's one person standing. The only community is when you do a co-op game together. You're still killing people. But yeah, honestly, she was like loving the whole movie. My wife, who never wants to watch violent movies, just saw it going on and came in and she couldn't leave the whole time. What you what you have a knack for is a really good blending of that kind of action that you just talked about when you're grinning yeah. in which you, in which you're I don't want to say cartoonish because that's too easy of a word, but but there's something about it that is hyper realized. It is it is not you're not watching three days of the condor or something that has a gritty, realistic feel to it that is, you know, disturbing. I mean, the the, the post office guy coming in in the beginning of three days of the condor is still disturbing and i saw it as a kid there's by the way a, like i reference that movie every week yeah uh, i mean there's such a week. realism to it so yeah. so it's, so it's like this this was something that she, you know she the entire movie like was was just transfixed with all the intricacies that we're going to talk about in the spoiler section which we're going to get to soon of just everything from the traps the cur the character creates to the weird decisions. So, so we're, yeah. we're going to get to the spoiler section. You know, the last question before I get there would be that concept of this, every man who we later learn has a past, you know, he has the fighting skills baked in, but he's trying to live a suburban life like that. That's clear from the trailer. And I'm only talking about stuff in the trailer right now. <laughs> the, the concept that he, that he has sent off his, you know, humble path by someone stealing his daughter's kitty cat bracelet. When did that idea pop in your mind? Because it is so funny and it, it does have that resonance of John Wick. You mess with my dog. Oh, no, here's but the other it's thing. Sillier. It's sillier. Killing yeah, your I mean, dog is a John future. Wick and, 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 and nobody like uh, if you, they're not antiheroes, right? Like in my head, they're heroes. Like John Wick's greatest uh, strength is he befriends people. Like when you really look at those movies, like, he everyone kind of owes him for that thing he did you know he's a badass sure but like he's also you know got a moral compass for being a slaughterer of man right and i think with the kitty cat bracelet it was what is the excuse you know there's no subtext to that actual bracelet 
it's an excuse for him to let loose for the first time in a long time. And when, of course, you realize who did what they did and he can't. Uh, and then, of course, you get in the movie and, it, and an opportunity arises when he can. It's just roller coaster. You know? okay, we're going to talk about that. I think that's a good place to stop before the spoiler section. <laughs> last question, non-spoilers. <laughs> what was the budget and schedule? That's our last non-spoiler question. Dude, $180 million. No. Uh, it was $15 million. Uh, give or take. No. Uh, I think it's something like 15, Wait, 4, 14, 8. One, five? One, five, baby. Wow. Uh, and to that. Ilya, uh, Ilya killed it on the screen. Oh, dude. That's again, crazy. man. You think of uh, the producers, the director, the editors, wow. uh, you know, Daniel Bernhardt, um, who we all recognize and love from all of his work. Dude, he trained Bob for three years. Uh, they became close. I mean, he was integral to this thing. And he had a great getting his ass kick scene on the bus, right? Um, but everyone, you know, I mean, you know, it'd be cliche for me to refer to anything as like, oh, it was a labor of love, right? Um, but when I first showed up on that, on that, that on set, it was two in the morning, uh, Winnipeg. It was cold. There is a bus crashed in the middle of the street there is a body lying in front of it and I'm walking up and I hear, okay, cut. And that body gets up at Bob. And that was a hard 24 hour day of fight, fight, fight. And everyone's exhausted. But the number of times when Ilya would yell cut and everyone would be like, Oh, and you're fucking tired, but you just, ah, the energy. And that's Bob, man. Bob, even when he's got the big coat and he's got the frozen caro syrup on his, his face and he's been dropped on his ass any number of times, I show up and he's like, we're here, Derek, come here, big bear, how can you, we do, oh, so $15 million, uh, miraculous. And yet I mean, the same obviously, obviously, there's Canadian tax credits that go into play yeah. and we don't have those strangely enough here in America, especially in California. I still don't know why. I love Canadian production. I am not yeah. in any way. I love what, hey, I, big plug on Winnipeg, man. Love yeah. that city. Love the people. And that that crew was phenomenal. I, just, I will never understand why there are not better California tax credits, though. It's just yeah. it's the strangest thing. But so how many days was the shoot? How, how much? How many days? did I, I'm not quite sure, but I want to say uh, around 30, sub okay. 30, you wow, know, that's like great. 28 to 31. I'm, and they could they could correct me as well. But it was, you know, to to again, I, I say it's quite a bit, but to Dave, Dave Leach's credit, like on the last day, they had a pre-lit set, which is the action sequence. And by the way, that action sequence in the script was never really written um, just because we didn't, you know, when, when we got there, it was like cool stuff happens. So when you which, see which the, sequence are you referring to uh, the, the siege, you know, the, the, look, the very look at the fact you're talking about the factory. Yeah. The factory. Siege. Okay. We're starting to get into spoilers, but yeah. Okay. So it was okay. pre-lit. So it was pre-lit and, and uh, we're, they're out of time and money. And Dave grabbed a camera and uh, an assistant and spend the whole day walking around getting pickup shots, you know? So here's David Leach coming off of, some of the largest movies known to man and being a producer on this thing and still geeking out and going, Hey, let me lend a hand. And in the editing phase, uh, they had a folder that was like, Hey Dave. And they'd be like, Oh, thank God he got that thing. You know? That's so great. when you think of true collaboration, that was a bunch of us geeking out uh, on the on the playground after school. So we are getting into the spoiler section, folks. If you have not yet seen Nobody, please go rent it online in the place that you would find movies to rent. You know how to do that. You're going to be going to iTunes or Amazon, obviously. You could also see it on demand. I'm pretty sure through your cable system. So rent it, buy it, do whatever you want. Because we're now we're going to get into the spoilers. I, I think that it's that it's interesting. You know, like the movie's called Nobody. And he's from an official CIA program where he's titled nobody yeah. and, you know, it's all redacted and you're, you're, you have a amazing skill for conveying a lot of backstory in a very short amount of time. When, when did, when did the concept that he would be part of this nobody program, that's pretty much all you need to say. You don't need a big monologue about it come about. I mean, by the way, again, the way that you did it, somebody being blackmailed, they have to go through old folders to get it. You're, you're also very good on quick exposition that's yeah. entertaining. When, when did that come about? Dude, I mean, I grew up with the old uh, Pulp Fiction, you know, Pulp Noir, you know, uh, Alstrom Klein's of the world. And uh, they were very, very, very swift to, to key on that. And what I loved is like movies like, uh, and I say this quite a bit, but like uh, North by Northwest, 
you have that one line where the guy says he's a man who deals in secrets and you're like, Oh, that's a whole movie. It does. Nothing else matters. Like what's in, what's in the, you know, what's the MacGuffin? Who gives a shit? Like, yay, let's have fun. But also like, I, I, I remember that scene in faster with Dwayne Johnson, where at the beginning he's standing there as that giant Samoan guy and the giant Samoan guy looks at the tattoo on his arm and he's just kind of like, I'm out. That is exposition that I want to do. And so it's really those kinds of things where you see a tattoo or Ronan is another great example. I bring up weekly. People are sick of hearing it, but like, you know, where he, where uh, he spills his coffee and the guy catches it. And he's like, you know, in that moment, volumes of, uh, of understanding went between the two. So in film uh, you have to get as close to the answer swiftly. And that's the best way to do it in TV. You can, you can bait and switch for seasons, you know? Um, that to me has been the biggest change between the two mediums, but I always love where you have that scene in a movie where it's like, yeah, he, you know, when the, the classic, like Jason Bourne and Treadstone speeches, you're just like, what? <laughs> I love that. You know, it's both unique yet familiar, you know? Yeah. And, and it, I'm curious, like, just like starting out on the page before we get into the, the details, is there, is there. Are there any left turns you could tell me where for a while nobody was going to have this subplot or go in this direction and it never made it on the screen? It's not a deleted scene. It was just for a week or a month. There was like, oh, my God, this is so cool. It's going to be so great. But then you had to yeah. abandon it either for budget schedule or just well, dude, honestly, it didn't fit. One of the ones we all loved, but because of budget and because of time we didn't do is when that one guy, it was it was our favorite sequence. And uh I can't remember the actor's name. I'll look him up quick, but he played kind of the CIA agent. Uh, he's the guy who kind of shows up. He's the guy that he's the barber, right? Oh, the barber. So I was yeah. going to ask about that later. Yeah. So he, he was, he was, a, he, he was a much bigger part of the script, but bigger my five more pages and he'll be bigger throughout. But the idea is that the scene that we wrote is that guy, uh, you know, who I think he's, isn't he like the principal from community? I don't remember, I but think. anyway, he, uh, gets a call and, and the guy's like, can you look this guy up? And he types in Hutch's name on the computer and you get the spinning wheel of death and the computer shuts down. And he's like, huh? So he walks out and it's a crowded floor of people. He takes the elevator downstairs, goes to a, a second terminal. Same thing happens. Goes downstairs to the old library cards, finds something missing, goes downstairs. And we follow him MOS, you know, set music only until he gets down into the archive archives archives which is this bolted room where you have all these leather bound books and there's this stack of leather bound books and they're wrapped tight with twine he cuts the twine opens it up and every single line of these books is redacted except for the word nobody and he's like uh and then he goes back upstairs with one of the books or a couple of the books and he, he goes on on his floor and as he walks to your office you realize the entire floor is empty and he walks into the office and there's that character, the barber. We loved it so much, but we didn't have the time or the money, right? That's great. But that kind of the you know unspoken. So, so the paradigm. barber was going to show up to the archivist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah. knew that there was a search going on. Okay. But that scene though, in, in the barbershop, and it's it's so good though. It's almost yeah. like it's good enough, you know, like cool. And it leaves you wanting more and seeing what else exists in this world, you know? Well, and, and it's the thing that you're good at, again, as I said, like exposition coming at you fast, but in an interesting way, you do that with these characters, like the barber, right? There's the concierge of the hotel, you know, the Continental. You take these, these jobs that you think are kind of boring, but like, no, they're interesting characters in this universe. So the barber is, of course, connected. And, yeah. you know, it was, it was an exposition dump for sure, but a very short one and a very interesting one. And it made you wonder more about that character. So that's, that's, that's cool to hear. You were talking about seeing a tattoo. You know, you, you have this way of broadcasting exposition again, now that we could get into these details in which, look, somebody breaks into to, to nobody's house in the beginning he he decides to kind of let them off because he knows yeah. that he could just take them. And when he finds out that they stole his daughter's, you know, bracelet. So he thinks um, he, he hunts them down based on a tattoo. And at one point when he goes into tattoo parlors yeah. and he's talking about it, a veteran notices his tattoo and it's the yeah. cards, you know, seven and two. And, you know, which is a, a shitty starting hand in poker for sure. The worst. One. <laughs> yeah, the worst so, hand. so basically 
and that guy is just like he's out he leaves and like you know that like there's more to to hey, we're, than, we're in the spoiler section right we are in the spoiler okay. section. my favorite my favorite thing about that scene that wasn't in the script is uh they cut it as a kind of an internal joke but everyone responded so well to the guy walking out of the room closing the door and going chink 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 yeah he chink, locks the doors click, click slide slide and they thought it was too comic booky, but everyone's reaction was just laughing. Oh, and so we were nice. like, let's do it. Let's keep it, you know? And and well, and it broadcasts to the other guys in the tattoo room that are still with him. But they've just <laughs> been they've just been locked in. I love um, I do like, oh hey man, what do you need? <laughs> you know, exactly. like, and and so you're you're really good at doing that, but like even when he finds the young couple that robbed him. He's starting to kick their ass. They have no idea what he's talking about with the bracelet. And then he hears a baby crying. And all he does is peek into the room and you see a baby on an oxygen mask. Mm -hmm. And it says everything in three seconds. Yeah. And so, you know, when did that idea coming, coming up with not just having a baby and they were parents that, you know, were doing this for their young child, but like they have a baby that has medical needs. No, I think it, that was, you know, at the very, very beginning because we love the idea that Bob, you know, Hutch, the character, he was going to get his revenge and he needed this outlet. But then he saw that they were desperate and that they were human and that he connected with them on the best side of who he was. And it was, he was deflated, you know? So when he leaves and, you know, he punches the wall and it's raining in Los Angeles for some reason <laughs> and, and he gets on the bus, you're just like, we always referred to it as almost the, 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 our, our, our homage to the end of the graduate, you know, and, you know, it's a very sad scene. And when this happens, the voiceover came about uh, via Ilya in uh, editing and uh, you know, the, the whole, I hope these guys like hospital food. When I heard that, I, I just lost it. Like, that's just well, awesome. Well, yeah. I could see the movie without voiceover. Like, so it, I mean, and, it, and, and it's great because voiceover is sometimes a crutch, but it's funny because like, if you didn't have that, we still know he's going to kick their ass, but it was actually a way to sneak in a laugh. And the line Dude. of, I hope these guys like hospital food was great. You know, so, and, and, it, and it wasn't overused by any means because it wasn't used really to explain story details. Yeah. I mean, again, it, we, I, I say this in everything I do, but it's like best idea wins, you know, an iron sharpens iron. And, you know, when you look at some of the things, when you're on set and someone has that look and Daniel would have that look and we'd be like, you, say it and then you say it, you're like oh let's give that a try and i think that's what ended up happening you know because dude when i saw the, the trailer for the first time it's one of my favorite memories of my entire life because it took us five years it's this tiny little movie that could right and we're not reinventing the wheel we're just making a cool fucking wheel right and bob called me and he's like have you seen the trailer and i was like no and he's like i'm sending you a link put me on speaker. We're watching it together. And it was him and I watching that red band trailer and just cackling. Uh, so I think that energy is key, you know? Well, it, and it's, it's interesting because that bus scene brings us to like the undoing, you know, of the movie, like, like if he didn't, if he wasn't in that bad mood and wanting to fight, he would have just kept going on his regular path, but he wanted to kind of reactivate himself to us, to, to, to an extent. And, and my daughter was kind of like, well, what did those guys really do? Like, did they, did they deserve to be put in the hospital because they were creepy? Cause I was like, look, they're drunk drivers. So fuck them forever. Just for that, yeah. just for starters, like drunk drivers, come on, get a freaking Uber. It's, you know, like, like, like you get a taxi, even in the old days, like don't drink and drive and put other people at risk. Like no, no need for it. But yeah. beyond that, like, yeah, they were threatening when they walk on the bus, but it's interesting because he just wanted to see if they would push back. And they do was the way that I explained it. And that's basically the basis of your story in which you have this affinity for the Russian mob and all the, by the way, like <laughs> and all their extravagancies and they happen to be Russian mob connected. So tell us Dude. when that story moment occurred to you that, Oh yeah, the way that this guy is going to tangle, he's tangling with the Russian mob and they're out. Dude, that's just so funny is, is in the original, it's not a Russian mob. It's just a mob. Right. And when Ilya got on board, he's like, oh, no, it's got to be a Russian mob. They're fucking cool. And you did such a great job with them in John Wick. Like, dude, Russian mob, right? And, of course, when he um, uh, cast, got to look his name up. I always forget it. Uh, Alexei, 
right? Uh, as the bad guy, it was like, yeah, great, you know? And you, and when you think of the bus scene, that was always in there because we thought of, uh, to me, the best action scenes in anything are intimate. They're very small, you know? Like, Taken's a weird movie, but I, you know, I love it like the rest of us. But when he finally gets into that room with the guys and makes them say the name on the matchbox, right? Yeah. And, and he said, I told you I'd find you. And that goes down like, oh, shit, right? And then, of course, old oh boy, the raid, you know, all those kinds of things. And what we liked about the bus was uh, that scene where the bad guys are going to do bad things to that, that uh, young woman, potentially. Uh, they make the bus driver pull over. She gets out. Bob's the last. Bob is about to step off. He closes the door, steps back. What are you going to do, old man? And he, he empties the gun. He's like, I'll oh, fuck you up. And at, my favorite memory in regards to that line is I watched at a little Dolby theater in Burbank somewhere, right? With the post-production crew uh, that had seen that movie 70 times, you know? And one of those guys, like the, the movies he'd worked on, you could geek out forever. And when he says that line, that guy chuckled you know and you're just like yeah because it's working you know ah, it's it. it's a great moment and it's it's an amazing scene i'm curious how your action looks on the page because you have a good knack of, of being very intimate with your locations and you know there's everything from the the poles that we, you would use to hold on to when you're riding the bus that are used as weapons but also especially i was cracked up when the the stop wire was used to strangle right. someone and the 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 bell is dinging for like next stop, please. It, that stuff that stuff's in the script, and a lot of that stuff though is because it, once Ilya was a, was attached, we did a, a deep dive, right? But a lot of that's Daniel too, man. A lot of that's that second unit team, and, and they're just geniuses. But, but so, that, did you have that wire moment yeah, in your script? Yeah, that was in there. The grabbing the bottle, the, the leg. I mean, what was always in there was gra- using a knife, and because uh, the one guy's throat is crushed. I, I was going to bring that up. Put the straw through, you know, for, which the, for the youngins out there, there was a television show called ER way back in the day. <laughs> and there was a very special episode where somebody's trach was messed up and George Clooney was the young, you know, doctor who was reckless. And he's yeah. like using a pen tube yeah. and he's using a razor and he's you know, like giving air to somebody's trach tube. And it's just a great kicker to your scene in which, in which, you know, nobody walks up and he like takes a knife a- across this guy's cha- trach who can't breathe and he takes a soda straw and like, or was it a soda straw? Yeah. 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 And, and like, and like just allows this guy to breathe. And like, that was a funny kicker as well. And that was in your script too, right? Is the kicker. Oh yeah. Cause the other thing too, is we wanted like Indiana Jones is some of the, one of the most perfect characters ever because he loses the entire movie and wins at the end, but he loses everything. Right. And what we just wanted to share with Hutch is like, he didn't, at the beginning of the fight gets his ass handed to him. Right. And really it comes down to, he has more will than them and he's rusty. And once he gets moving progressively, he becomes a better fighter, especially with that home siege, you know? Um, but when uh, he does that, you have that expression of like, oh, I don't want to kill anyone. And that's why he does it, you know? Um, but we wanted to show that he wasn't quite there, but as soon as they attack him at his home, the classic, you don't do that. Now he's, yeah. You know, the, the, the classic John Wick, you know, people keep asking me if I'm back. Yeah. You know, so what was it like when you sat down with Ilya when he when he came on? Because you said you, you did a deep dive with him. Were you guys getting into storyboards together? Was there a, a, a rewrite? Any any big notes that you remember from him? Oh, huge rewrites, you know, huge rewrites. But Talk like us the through bones, some of the some bones were always there. The foundation and character always there. But then you look at the realities of the budget. Uh, you look at the realities of the shoot day and availability and all that kind of stuff. Things are perpetually changing. But we both loved the script so much to change it, you know, and to, to craft it and to just, I believe every script should be malleable, you know, even up to the day of. And so it was really making sure that this script wasn't mine or his, but ours, you know? And when you look at that movie, it is a pretty wide cast net of ours, you know? Um, every voice was heard. And even on the days of shooting, ideas would come up from the least likely sources to make a good scene better. Um, so, you know, it was just kind of like not changing for changing sake, but going, this is a great scene. Could it be better? You know, this is a, this is a cool idea. Could it be better? And it was never second guessing ourselves. It was just really, like I said before, working with Ilya was iron sharpens iron. And I never, you know, of course you get frustrated because you're tired. I mean, 
but it was always like, you hear a good idea. It should be, God damn it. That's oh, 10 hours of work, but it's a better idea. You know, it's cool. I, you know, another thing like you saying that you love James Bond, obviously you, you have like little, just very subtle, you know, gadgets here. You have a two way yeah. radio. That's a, you know, that's a old stereo where he's talking to Riza in the beginning and, and even when he's ready to destroy his house, I know I'm skipping forward. We'll get to that in a second, but he, he puts on a certain record and the record player literally starts sparking so that the room is going to go on yeah. to fire. And it was just, it was a nice effect. It was simple. So simple. W- when do some of those ideas come about on the page just for these, these simple pieces of tech that you were putting in there that were still kind of cool. Yeah. I, I think a lot of times I really like the characters that are analog, but they're comfortable in a digital world. Right. And that's what, you know, and again, to that point, what Bond did so well is uh, his best gadgets were very simple. Like, you know, uh, a they got kind of, they, they got, sometimes they got too sci-fi for me, but every now and then where it's like a watch that does that thing, a pen that does that thing, all of that's great. But the world building of like those old, uh, you know, noirish spy trade craft movies, East Germany, West Germany of, you know, there's a fake brick, you know, there's a bar, but then it has another bar behind it. And then, Ooh, the speakeasy, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's where you get to geek out because even when you get down to the secret space, you kind of want to wonder, is there a door in the backyard in the background of this one? Um, and that's what, you know, that's what our favorite, you know, story franchises worlds do. They encourage you to keep thinking, you know, um, which as a kid who grew up with star Wars, you know, watching the Mandalorian, it's kind of like, you know, Oh, that's what we were talking about when I was 11 or 12, you know, like, Oh dude, they did that thing. Holy shit. That guy's back. Oh man. You know, like, <laughs> you kind of geek out. Um, and I think also realizing that in the world of James Bond, James Bond's cool, but like he's got M and Q and Felix lighter and the, 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 you know, the, 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 the women that are arguably more badass than he is. That's always the, the ironic thing, but it's just also realizing that your lead character is important. Sure but he's only as cool as the world he inhabits, you know? Julian as an antagonist was, was really cool. And, and it was good that, you know, you separated him from the, the, the John Wick kind of villains in which he's, he's a bit more out there because we are first introduced to him as a singer. Yeah. Right. And, and, and one of the villain, one of his cohorts brings up like, you know, Hey, great song, but how are we going to trust you with our money? And he just walks up and kills somebody, yeah. you know, and it's going to add more to their shares of this, you know, big money collective that he's involved with. T- tell us about the development of Julian as a character, because there is a complexity to him in which he kind of wants to get out. Yeah. And it's and it's something that actually is offered later by nobody when, you know, in a, in a, in a sense of uh, the, the, the movie that I can name that came before that did this, The Dark Knight, you know, like all of their money is burnt oh, to yeah. the ground. Yeah. And he's and and nobody basically tells him like, look, this is your chance to get out. Yeah. If you want to get out, we could both walk away just fine, and you can you know, figure out a way to rebuild. But it's it's it. Yulian's a fascinating character and very comical, sadistic as well. You know, I, uh, it's weird. It's a weird movie to bring up in this regards. But a lot of that relationship and that moment in the bar and that character came from Schindler's List, where you had that moment with Schindler. Didn't and- see us going there, but okay. Yeah, no. But this is why you had that moment where, where Schindler meets with um, the, 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 the bad Nazi, the bad Nazi, they're all bad, but like, you know, the, the, the big bad, right? Ray Fine. Yeah. Ray Fines. And he talks about forgiveness, you know? And, they, and then you have that scene where uh, Ray is in front of the mirror and goes, I forgive you. You know, I forgive you. And then he ends up shooting that kid, right? Super, super dark. But that conversation is interesting because you, you wonder if he in that moment was on the cusp, you know? Of almost and, understanding, right? Yeah. And that's the what we wanted with Bob going, look, man, like, you don't like this life. I don't, I didn't like it. I got out. Do you, you want to be a singer in your own little cabaret? I, you know, you, you, that was always where that character went. And of course, because of, of, of time and the way these movies go, it, 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 it just rendered down a bit. But like, we always love the idea that he wants out. He's got this art collection, doesn't need money anymore. He doesn't want to he doesn't want to babysit the fucking ob shack, you know? Um, and yet the real, Just for the, the listeners, reality- the ob shack is the name of all the money collective that he's in charge of guarding for that month or whatever period yeah. of time. And that's all Ilya, man. He, he knew, he, he knew that the realities of that. And I was like, that's cool. That uh, is cool. Well, what was could, it before? What was it before that? Was he just same kind of thing? Yeah. Honestly, same kind of thing, same kind of 
dark night of it all. Right. But he had, he knew of that. And suddenly it was like, that's a cool layer. Like that's a cool, like hint at what could be, but you know, to me, the best villains are, you know, when you look at, you know, you say Joubert from, uh, you know, Max and Sada three days in the Connor, he's gentle, he's kind. And if, if you're, if he doesn't have a contract on you, you're safe, you know? Uh, but then you look at, uh, you know, Thanos is the greatest example. He's kind of got a point, you know, you look at, uh, what was Michael B. Jordan's character from Black Panther? But he's kind of got a point, you know? Yes. Where, you, you know, it's like, I know he's the big bad, but like, eh, you know. They he, have to believe, they have to believe in what they're doing yeah. to be able to do it, even though it is wacky. Because, I mean, Thanos, like, you know, they cut through his his argument pretty fast. Oh, you know? yeah. And yeah, he's yeah. just crazy. The, the thing about Yulian, though, is, is just like, he, even his sadism is is cartoonish. Because aside from that that scene in the bar, the next scene when he realizes the people beat up on the bus were, you know, his 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 younger brother, I believe, and his introduction into the hospital is a door opens and he throws a lounge chair at somebody in a hospital bed, and it was just it, like you shouldn't be laughing, but like it was like even my like little daughter was laughing because it's so cartoonish, yeah. like you like it's so like on the list of things you don't do in a hospital. Yeah. throw a chair at someone's head that's in a hospital bed. And we've seen Dude. the hospital scenes a million times where, you know, somebody's knee is up and they're pulling on the weights and whatever. Like those things we've seen. <laughs> this one, I got to give you credit, man. That was some brand new uh, crazy right there. You know, it's funny, though, is when you, when you talk about that scene when uh, Bob meets with Julian, right? Uh, at H- Hutch and Julian. And right. it, you can tell that Julian's really on the fence, you know, of like, you know, maybe I can, I can leave, but that kind of stuff. Bob and Ilya's favorite scene in, in, in when we talked about it, and, and I totally understand why, is when Bob leaves and gets in his car and he's waiting. Yes. And then when Yuli and the guys come out, he gives this look of like, oh, good. Like they're coming after me. <laughs> it's like, that to me is full on genre. Like oh, that speech, it was true. It's from his heart, but he really wanted the bad guy to come for him. You know? Yeah. I couldn't decide actually, cause I was clocking that look and I couldn't decide if he was like disappointed, like, Oh buddy, you made the wrong choice. I'm going to just have to end you now. Like yeah. it, it was a good scene. I mean, but that's funny that like he wanted it. Cause that, that is about where he is in the movie. Your, your music choices were great. And that's Ilya, man. I mean, yeah, okay. honestly, we, we, uh, I'm a big fan of anytime you use a song that's known or has a certain affinity towards some kind of scene, you use it elsewhere. And I'm, I might've put a couple of songs in there that were a million dollars and we couldn't use, you know? Um, and he came up with a lot of those that are just genius. I mean, Ilya had great choices because it's anachronistic, you know, it's, it's going against the type of what you associate with the song and showing it like, in a violent moment, did you know if they had any trouble clearing those rights, knowing that it was going to be used in? Well, I, I think I think it was because we're the little production that could. It was finding songs like songs that were available for a pennies on the dollar. That okay, kind of, okay. You know? But you know, one of the ones we brought up is I love the first Kingsman and how they use Casey and the Sunshine right, right. Band, right? And you awesome. You know, it's like using that kind of stuff. There's the blending here that we've seen in these type of movies before for a man of action who's retired of, of you know, it comes to his home. And it was cool the way he kind of locks his family into this like, you know, safety room, you know, panic room in the basement. And he just goes through the house and has it out with everybody and is, you know, d- definitely uh, taking care of business in his house. And it's it's interesting, though, because it brings us to this whole concept of what is the story in your mind between him and his wife? Yeah. Because in the beginning, they're sleeping with a big ass pillow between them. She doesn't really respect him. You kind of get that sense in the beginning of like, you know, before you realize he's a man of action, if you haven't seen the trailer somehow, that she's disappointed in him. And, you know, it's there's a, there's a lot of vibes going there. And we actually never really solve it. Aside, you know, that's, she, that's kind of the point. Respect him when he has his call to action. Mm-hmm. She does respect that. But it's it's very unclear. You know, she clearly knows how to dress um, severe wounds. She's using medical glue to stitch him up. So she yeah. she knows what she's doing. But well, you, you know, it's kind of like we'll tune in next week. We'll we'll get to that. But what we didn't want to do is Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Uh, we wanted to do more of you know, you know, she's outside of life. They still love each other, but there is this world between them. Just life happens. Time happens. Things happen. You know. 
Uh, I, we never wanted to craft a character that you hated um, because we've seen that way too many times. She's trying and he's trying and they're just missing each other. So when these things go down, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a, an opening to that bridge where you're like, I've missed you. I've missed you too. Like there's the, the unspoken of all of these things, you know? And yeah, it's a surprise to them, but at the same time, she, there's the hint at, you know, none of us are quite who we are. Um, she was awesome. And I uh, can't wait to see more. Ooh, hey, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You could also find us on the iPad app, Backstory. You know, folks, we're working on our new Oscar issue. There is so much for you to explore in issue 42, which is still our current issue. You could check out the table of contents at Backstory.net. You know, I've been saying this for a while. One of, one of my mission statements was just to bring cool scripts to life that are unproduced as well. And aside from all the great content in the magazine that includes showrunners, screenwriters, directors, playwrights, comic book writers, you know, we also have two really interesting scripts in our off the shelf section. And these are unproduced scripts by writers of note. So I have Simon Kinberg of X-Men Days of Future Past fame, and he has the script that he sold right out of college. It's called Ghouls of New York. It's about grave robbers in 1890s New York, and it's it's really entertaining. And uh, it's based on a true story, by the way, as well, which is fascinating. I still think it could get made, but it was so fun to have Simon share us the entire script for you to read, along with an interview about it and, and, and his experiences on it. We also have screenwriter-director Joe Carnahan with his screenplay, LA57, which he co-wrote with his brother, Matthew Michael Carnahan. And... Joe and Matthew have been trying to make this for over a decade, and I think they're getting really close. They shared not only the entire screenplay, but also production art, um, you know, kind of concept art from it in the article. So th that's just two articles out of the whole magazine. There's so much to explore. And, you know, if, you, if you've never read us, you could, you could test drive us by reading an entire free issue of Backstory Magazine at our website. So I know you'll dig that. And uh, look, if you like what you see, you could subscribe and you could save $5 with this code. Save five. That's save and the number five. Enter it at your shopping cart as you check out over at backstory.net. And your login credentials at Backstory will also work for you on an iPad. But look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and the Backstory Magazine YouTube watchers. Uh, remember, we are taking all of these Zooms and we were putting them into YouTube on the Backstory Magazine page so you could actually watch me interview the guest. Um, it would really mean a lot to me to have my YouTube watchers and podcast listeners become subscribers of Backstory Magazine. So thanks for considering right as we're building our awesome 2021 Oscar issue. But now, without any further ado, I hope you're going to go out and rent Nobody wherever you watch movies, either iTunes, Amazon, or through On Demand, um, because we are going to get right back into our chat with screenwriter Derek Kolstad about his latest film, Nobody. Riz's character was interesting. How, how did you decide how much or how little of him to use? He obviously comes in at the end um, in person, and he was the voice on the two-way radio we okay. always had the, the we always had the voice in the two way radio. Um, I like having the the quote unquote like um, the oracle, the voice of God, the brother, you know. And uh, originally we because I had met him and I'm I'm doing some stuff with him. It was like you know let's get someone like Sterling K Brown, right? Um, but once uh, someone once someone said RZA and we heard his voice, it's like yeah, I can't unsee that. So RZA, right? And they the nicest guy in the world and fucking great in that role and he and Bob clicked the, the movie is about family, you know, about him trying to save his own while his father, you know, uh, Tony, come on, <laughs> Christopher Lloyd. Like, right. On. I, I, uh, I love the character of the father. Tell me, tell me about creating that because he, you it know, was, it was very funny to have him in an old age home. It's also a trope of the retired dad. You know, yeah. but, but, but like, it was a great trope and Christopher Lloyd rocked in it. So, oh, so and in fact, my, the, the scene that got the biggest rise out of me was outside, I mean, the bus scene, of course, you know, cause you got to finally see this thing that you worked so hard on, but that scene where, um, the two Russian guys come into the room, one of who is Ilya, you know, that's his, that's his, uh, cameo. Right. And they're gonna, and he's quote unquote sleeping and it's revealed that he has a shotgun in his lap. And that look he gives, I lost my shit because Ilya's is blown in, you know, 
folded and, and you know like and then the guy comes down he's listening he's watching the, the western on high while he's choking a guy like that to me is the funnest you can have in grindhouse genre it, i mean it was the silliest thing because because yeah. yes like we've shown the security guard is asleep both times that we see the facility and we've shown that christopher lloyd's character is watching these loud westerns and these two guys come in and he just has this shotgun under a blanket yeah. and and like just just does them in he gives this look he gives the christopher lloyd look yeah and and then and then the guy runs in and like like the characters are just out of frame from the guy's vision he's yeah. like turn the tv down i mean again comedy with with action to just remind us that you know this isn't a terrible onslaught it's it's yeah. a silly movie well, and, and what i wanted to do too and, and this is always since the beginning is like dude dad loves son son loves dad brother loves brother brother loves dad. i mean all those kind of things where at the end they know shit's going down so they're gonna help yeah. They show up well, right, right. right yeah. off of the sunset, you know, like, yes, I want to see more of them. You know, the, the fact that you show him and, you know, young Riza in a picture and that they're brothers, like, it's just like a throwaway. Like if somebody's glancing away, like they wouldn't see it, but it was just like that other little touch of exposition that yeah. shows that they're part of a family dynamic that was fun. And by the way, only because we're sitting here talking of Riza. I'm just saying this to anyone in the world that's tuning in in iTunes or Spotify or watching this on, on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. I've had the pleasure not once of, but twice of seeing RZA live score the 36th Chamber of Shaolin, which is just a great karate flick, and he's obsessed with it. So he does a full live score of it that is like an experience in and of itself, and it adds to the movie. And Unfortunately, the problem is from everything I've ascertained, because I've, 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 I've actually wanted to interview him about it. He's using so many clips of so many other pieces of music that it's almost impossible to clear them all to ever release these two things together. So it's just a live performance that he seems to do, or at least he was before the pandemic, maybe once every two years, he was at least coming through LA and I know some other cities, but if you ever have a chance to see it and, and Derek, I mean, like even for you, oh, like yeah. if, if you ever have a chance to see it, you'll be blown away. Yeah. Um, you know, just, just like a side note, taking notes, tell me if there was a good note that you really remember getting from Ilya and also from the other silent partner in your life, you know, Sonia. Because well, like, Sonia, you know, during, that, during John Wick too, you talked a lot about your wife Sonia. But and, she's and, the she's the line of first defense, man. You know, she she reads everything I do um, before it goes to Mike and Josh, which is agent and and manager, who I've been with forever and her family and friend. She may she's the first draft. They're the second draft. Cheryl and Debbie, which is part of Mike's team, is the third draft. And then by the time I turn in the script, it's the fourth or fifth draft. You know, um, but. In regards to their notes, Sonia's is always like, look, man, read this, read this scene outline that reads like a horror scene, violent wise. And, you know, when you're in the mood and you're just like, eh, type the word behead, and you're like, eh, maybe not that. Right. Um, and then with Ilya, Ilya, man, when it came to music, when it came to tone, uh, when it when it came to uh, being a partner in the in the world build uh, and what we would both do was kind of going, let's not go too far in either way in action you can go you can have a horror movie once in a movie right anything more than that uh it becomes its own genre it's kind of tough you know uh and so for us and for him dude that like i said that last siege on the on the warehouse wasn't really written and it was kind of emails to him back and i during production and like dude i think it was his idea it wasn't mine with the uh mousetraps fucking cool uh, in every draft, you had the the gun in the in the frozen food, you know. Um, but a lot there's of the a, there's a gun put in there earlier by Uncle Charlie, and yeah. it's put in the refrigerator, and because it, it's the work of it's the place that nobody works. It's his place it, of business, and he's been. Was it like vegetarian it. burritos are in there or something you, like, yeah. you don't eat? Um, and so a lot of that, thir like a lot of that stuff, you know. That's what I loved about Dave and Chad. You know, what I love about Ilya is they get their hands dirty in the action. You know, they, they, in their head, they see it all. And so some of the tools uh, that uh, Hutch uses there at the end, Ilya's idea, you know, in, in, in building it out. So well, well, tell us about that for a second, because, you know, it is the conventional ending of like shootout at a factory, right? It's a classic convention of action films. And, and, and basically, 
here, I'm curious what did exist on the page. Cause you, you know, you sold this draft, you set it up and you're right. Like there is like mouse traps being used that are very elaborate. I barely understood what some of them did, but they, but I got it. Like I understood, like it is connected to a stapler. So when someone presses the staple on that desk, something's going to happen. There's yeah. a hand grenade that is being smashed down by, you know, some sort of press. a press. Yeah. How detailed did you get? And what did your production draft look like? If dude, I tend to... to get, dude, I tend to get really detailed and that kind of stuff. But on that one, it was <laughs> Ilya's notebook. And it's him working directly going, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. And me going, cool, and geeking out with him, right? But you had to have something in there when the draft sold. So I'm just curious, tell us what it was. Like, what was in your draft that sold? It was probably because uh, that was the, we, we got, to, when we got to draft, we went so fast. It was probably a couple of lines like, hey, because uh, most of the time I, I like to write action. I like to write chases, you know? That was, uh, here we got the siege. And he's going to use, we always had the whole, he buys the warehouse. He's going to work on all this stuff. You don't quite know what he's doing. And then you see it. But when it came time to actually determine what it was he was doing, you're, they're well into production, man. That is, that's really in the magic of that whole production team. You know, um, he would call me and we'd talk through certain things. Um, like, you know, with the, with the, uh, Claymore, you know, that was always in the script as the, the welcome mat, you know, um, but uh, yeah, a lot of that stuff was like, you know, it'd be cool. <laughs> Great. We don't have another idea. Go do that cool thing. <laughs> well, he has the, he has the Claymore in his meeting with Julian earlier. So that was interesting. Yeah. You know, like, and, and, and obviously having text that's actually printed face front toward face enemy. Front, you know? uh, yeah. Like, you know, sells what that thing is, even if you don't know. Um, would, would the piece of glass that he used as a shield protect him on the backside of a claymore, which expands uh, outward? I mean, technically, you know, hey, hey, technically Tom, it could. Hey, if Tom Cruise can use it in Edge of Tomorrow and be okay, yes. covered in alien goo, I figured we were okay. But that was, that, was, that was Ilya's idea, you know, and I, I really liked it because the classic, like this device I used as a little bit of a, a, a fulcrum in the moment is now all I have left and running towards the bad guy. And what's funny is the scene isn't him. He knows that it's not a suicide run, but it's a risk, you know? And that was our horror moment, you know, the way that goes off and uh, fun. It's just fun. like, to your point, man, if someone says to me, he's like, you know, nobody was pretty wild and wacky. You're like, fuck. Yeah. That was the point. <laughs> Did you have a good time? Cause even when you read some of these reviews and they're like uh, having a great time. And in the middle, they're like, is it a good movie now? I mean, but, but I loved it. And I, like, why did you put that line in? Like, the, you know, you look at the movies I loved as a kid and still love now. Yes, they're fucking fun. I, I, I mean, it was fun. My, my, my wife refuses to watch any serious movie whatsoever with violence lately. And like, she just sat down and she's like, well, I love Bob Odenkirk. And I'm like, yes, but like, he is violent here. So what, like, cause I was trying to understand why her and my daughter were so fine with, with nobody. Strangely, my 14 year old son was like upstairs and wasn't even interested. So <laughs> I'll never understand that one. But because <laughs> me as a kid, I, I would, I would totally have been into it, but I mean, it is fun and it is comic booky and it's, it gives you a, a step removed from the violence by, from the violence by making it zany. Yeah. And I think, and well, I, think, I think that's the thing is like, there is this element of we're all having fun here. And yet at the same time, you want to see, a, poor, a part of yourself in that character. You know, you can, you don't want to get too down, far down. You don't want them to deal with too many dark, dark, dark things or that the bad guy go too dark. Like I just, you know, in a day and age where we're all, we all have the streamers, right? And a new movie comes on and you're like, cool, two hours and 40 minutes. And you're like, is this the director's cut from the late eighties? Right. No, it's the first cut. That for us was like, dude, 90 minutes. And you're like, oh, yes. And then on Tuesday over lunch, you're like, gonna watch it. Yeah. It was like, that's, that's, that's what I watch. That's what I love. And that's my joy. And so come the end of it, it's a guy that you want to hang out with. There are a lot of characters that we watch their movies. You're like, he's probably a dick if he was my neighbor, but you'd hang out with Hutch because he's fucking Bob Odenkirk. <laughs> exactly. Huh? Well, you know, you've set up what could be a franchise. I hope it is. We're in strange times with the pandemic, people not exactly going to movies, people discovering it on their own. So I don't know how the studios are financially tracking what obligations need to be met to launch into a franchise. You know, 
tell us about your ending and coming up with this ending where they win. They're looking at a new house somewhere, somewhere else. And- her line, her line, that was Ilya. And uh, I think that was yeah, great. Because her line is like, you know, does it have a basement? Does it have a basement, great. right? Um, and we always had, you know, in the original script for the longest time, it was uh, his father-in-law and his brother-in-law and everyone having breakfast uh, together. And then you had the RV. And then it was him, his father, and his brother driving off. Uh, and the inside is full of art and cash. Like, in other words, the idea that they didn't burn all of it, right? And they're off to, because, you, you know, he, they there's this idea that they owe someone something, right? And they were going to drive off in the sunset. But the reality was kind of going like, yeah, but he just, he reconnected with everyone, you know? So that's, to Ilya's point, it became Christopher Lloyd and Rizzo driving off. And to me, like, I already, you know, I've already pitched the beginning of the second one. Um, and it's very similar to the, the tone of what I said at the beginning of this interview of, like, buy me a ticket on an airplane. And everyone's reaction is like, awesome. Well, what's the movie about? And I'm like, I don't know. But uh, to me, look, you, you got Endgame because you had Iron Man. You know, I want to stick with the intimate and everyone's talking about what this franchise will be, what the sequel will be. And I want it to be just a little bit bigger. You know, if we can get uh, Ilya and everybody a little bit of a bump, more importantly, some time, um, you know, you look at that bus scene. I want to do scenes like that, you know, love the Fast and Furious of it all, love the Jack Reacher of it all. But uh, I would rather have... um, the atomic blonde where she beats the shit out of the guys in the car, uh, than a full on, uh, race, which costs money. So yeah. where this goes from here, uh, however long Bob wants to do this, uh, I'm in, but I also don't want him to abandon his family in the movie. Uh, I want them to be a part of his mission, but I don't want them to be like, now he's part of their team. Like, no, there's going to be that, that kind of stainless steel divide. And yet like, the most important thing to him is his son, his daughter, his wife, and the kitty cat bracelet, you know? <laughs> and what that kitty cat bracelet is, really? Uh, that could be fun. <laughs> like, that, I don't know. That is when you, when you think what? of those things, you say the picture of them as kids, there's a part of me going like, eh, it's not just that, you know? Yeah. Well, I would, I would love to know more about that. I mean, like it could be a comic book series. It could be a TV series. I mean, there's a lot of things you could do with it. When did you decide that you were going to abandon the kitty cat bracelet? Cause it was so funny that in the middle of the movie, he just finds it under the couch. You know, the thing yeah. that incited him to, to all this violence. He's like, Oh, those people didn't steal it. Jeez. It was just, yeah, that's, that was always the way of it. That we loved it because like, that's what set him off was the kitty cat bracelet. And it had been misplaced. Right. Um, that's but you, you look at those little, 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 pieces, little icons, like the marker from John Wick. John Wick 2 changed any number of times, but the marker always stayed, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I always love, I, I always love the, uh, the book in uh, uh, the Indiana Jones Last Crusade that, you know, his, his father's notebook, you know, those kinds of elements, they, we did seed them in, in the script and we did seed them in the movie. We don't quite exactly know what that picture, that kitty cat, that thing or that thing is, but it's, we left it open like, it could be more than that. It could be that. Or what's more exciting, especially the bracelets. No, it's just his kid's thing. And that's what set him off. Uh, and to be honest, uh, if there was a fire in your house and it was just you and you had a second to grab something of value, it's probably that thing that's worthless. But it's worth everything to you. Yeah. You know? And that's that's kind of it, you know rewrites during production. I know you're on set for a while. Was there anything specific that you needed to rewrite? No, no, on this one. Uh, no, because by that point, I mean, you're a lean production. You have gone through this any number of times with, with Bob and Ilya and the producers and the studio that there's in order for it to work, you have to engineer no breathing room, you know? And so, yeah, there, there were elements of, of dialogue or, hey, is it okay if they say this? And at that point, I'm like, you don't have to ask me that. I'm like, yes, you know, like <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, I don't care how well or, or maintain and manage the production is, you're going to find that yourself at that moment with, we're out of time, we're out of money. And that's when the magic happens, you know? Yeah. Uh, and dude, like, I, I didn't do any heavy lifting during the shoot because all of the heavy lifting had been done beforehand and of course with anything once it's in the you know the the can 
then there's a different kind of heavy lift after. Editing is the last stage of storytelling. Is there, are there any scenes you want to tell us about that you really missed, but they, they needed to go? You know, honestly, it's the one I, I taught, told you about the archives, you know, and the guy going downstairs. Okay. Missed that. But that was never um, shot. So it was never shot, you know, so but anything when it comes was to shot. editing, no, there's, there's nothing off the top of my head right now. There's no scene that they shot that isn't in there, you know? And I mean, there is, don't get me wrong, but like, when you think of that sequence of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, a lot was shot for that because we didn't quite understand the pacing. We knew it was going to be too long in the tooth. But when the, when the editors did what they did, it was like, look, you couldn't have gotten to that 15 second sequence without rewriting and rewriting and rewriting what we're trying to do in those 20 pages. And, you know, I could be hurt saying like, Oh, it didn't make it to screen. It's like, no, it did. And it gave the producer, it gave the editors what they needed to do that awesome sequence. And you have to look at it going like, oh man, I didn't see that. Good job. Awesome. Better. You know, I know we're running out of time here. Like, so, you know, a couple last questions, but what was your toughest scene? What was the scene that you kept coming back to again and again on the page that you're having trouble cracking? And how did you creatively rise to the challenge? How did you crack it? When you think of the relationship with his wife, like the, since day one, it was like, you just don't want the audience to think she's a, uh, cold, callous, selfish bitch. You know, it was all of their scenes together. And what we also didn't want to have is that moment where you shift gears and you're in a different kind of genre of a movie, right? We wanted to have their interactions be rendered down to full on subtext and that there's more to what they're saying than what they really are. And we wanted to make sure that there's a balance that these are two, these are two people who loved each other and still do. And yet there's a world between them, all of their scenes together for as little, uh, Runtime it is, that's where the lion's share work went, you know? And uh, the dialogue scenes between um, our big bad and our hero, um, we spent a lot of time with that, you know? Um, but the rest, when it comes to action, man, oh, that's where, you, you know, Ilya, Dave, and uh, I are just like, oh, uh, you know, what do you want? <laughs> like, like I mean, we, this is this is the, the cinematic heroine of our youth. You know, we all have what I recall, I, I call as the back pocket ideas that you've been doodling since you're a kid. And someone's like, you know, we should have a fight here. And I'm like, I've been waiting years for you to bring that up. <laughs> I got an idea, you know, what was, what could you tell us about how your action looks on the page? There's, there's a problem sometimes people get when they write detailed action scenes because there's no dialogue and, you know, the reader actually has to read in a script. Yeah, no, I, I, I write them out. Um, but I'll also, it's kind of like you bookend it. So you begin with that first move, you know, grabs the wrist, snaps the wrist, snaps the arm, knife and neck, takes out the knee, snaps, you know, you do that kind of sequence that allows the audience or the reader to go like, oh, I saw all of that. And then it's like you use things like operatic or whirling dervish of death or gives as good as he gets. Like, you know, you, you know, you gotta be careful with like arterial sprays and beheadings and then you're in a, the horror genre. But and then you end with that last kill in the scene of being completely orchestrated. Um, but you know what Dave and Chad have always said is the best action scenes, uh, the cap at 45 seconds long, you know, anything longer than that. Uh, and, and again, I understand what they're saying, you know, is you, you want it to be like, bef you, you need to, you need to hold your breath and then you get air at 45 seconds or a minute or whatever it is. And everything changes. But like, when you think your favorite action scenes, like I bring it up all the time, but die hard with a vengeance when he kills the dirty cops in the uh, elevator, it's a, it's an awesome scene. It's fast. It's bloody. It's gross. And yet you're like, Oh, you know, or the classic Colin Firth and Kingsman, you know, manners make it man. It's a fast scene, but it's fucking fun. Right. Yeah. Two different genres, you know, I mean, action genre, but you have the surreal notion versus the more grounded approach. And yet they still, they roar, you know, you're also on Falcon and the winter soldier. I mean, tell us what's going on next. You know, what's that experience been like? I know that's a podcast in and of itself, but like, <laughs> have you enjoyed like dealing with somebody else's IP and, and kind of being able to have the, you know, a different world to turn to that you didn't have to completely create because part of it's created. But yeah. at, at, at the same time, there's a lot of world building to do. As a kid, being a fan of Marvel, being a fan of DC, being a fan of comic books in general, to be able to play in that world, to be able to walk into the Marvel offices past the different Iron Man suits uh, through ungodly security, um, to work on something that I knew of quite well when I was a kid was a dream. 
you know, and that room run by, you know, the creator Malcolm Spellman was my first real TV experience in the room. And it was warm and it was encouraging and it was joyful. I mean, it was, it was fast and furious. It was hard. Um, but dude, uh, when you think of the, the first, the first experience I had on a TV show was that, uh, color myself blessed, man. Just, it was an absolute joy and delight. I I've only seen one episode as the rest of the world has. Cause I, you know, we'll see the second episode tomorrow night, but, uh, I love what I've seen is, is there something else percolating? I mean, this, this took five years to get made. Is, is there something else that has been on your back burner that you're trying to bring to life that you want to tell us about? So many things. <laughs> okay. okay. No, there, there's, here's the thing is like, uh, you know, I, I've got this, there's any, any number of things like we should really do have a follow-up podcast about everything else. But like, um, it's funny because you work hard to get to the point where you get to work hard and that's where we are. And yet at the same time, you have to say no to things that aren't quite you. Um, and you know, I've got just cause, you know, I've got Hitman, I've got Booker, I've got, uh, you know, I'm, there are 30 things that I want to tell you right now that I don't think I can. So right. I'm just going to go like, yes, there's a lot of really cool shit. And by the way, it's, it's across the spectrum. There's stuff with actors that I love and respect and have like, you're going to be surprised in the next couple of weeks. Uh, who's going to do the nobody type thing. Who's going to do the John Wick type thing. And yet they, they're helping me build the sandbox. They're filling with sand they're playing. Um, but there's and Benny and the ink machine is another one. Uh, I don't know if you know that video game, but no. uh, I'm adapting it for TV with Ian Goldberg. And that's an absolute, <laughs> absolute delight. That's cool. Um, and, you know, there's so many things, man. But, like, again, I've gotten to the point where I get to, go, I, like, as Lance Reddick says, I get to do cool shit, and I am. Well, look, I, I really enjoyed Nobody. It was very silly. It was it was, it was was violence that uh, was so cartoony that it was just fascinating to watch the different setups and payoffs of what, what was happening. Yes, we live in a violent society, but things like this are almost a release because you see the bad guys get what's coming to them, yeah. which is a story that people always love, you yeah. know? So, so, I mean, kudos to you on, on another job well done. And I can't wait to see what you do next. Thanks for your time, Derek. Dude, appreciate it, man. Thank you. And that's how the Q and a went down. Special thanks again to screenwriter, Derek Kolstad for being so generous with his time and, and really giving a great chat about what it took to bring his latest script to the screen. Nobody. And remember, folks, you could go watch Nobody by renting it on Amazon or renting it on iTunes or watching it through on demand on your cable box. And I highly recommend that you do. It's a fun, fun little flick and uh, it's highly entertaining. And while you're surfing around online, I also hope you check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. If you've never read us before, you could read our entire free issue uh, and you could check us out. It's like you'll be able to test drive us. You could also read us through the Backstory iPad app. You could read the free issue there as well. And if you like what you've read, there's so much to explore. You could read our table of contents, see what else is inside, and you could even become a subscriber. That's right. I'm going to give you a discount coupon code to do it. You could use discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five that will save you $5 off a one year subscription. You need to use that code over at backstory.net, but your login credentials at backstory.net will also get you into our iPad app as well. So fear not, you'll be able to do that too. But look, it would mean a lot to me to have my Spotify and iTunes podcast listeners and also the people who are watching all of these interviews as Zooms over at the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. It would mean a lot to me to have all of you become subscribers or as many of you as you can because there's so much great content. I know if you dig this podcast that you'll dig Backstory Magazine. So thanks for considering. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2021. All rights reserved. Kids, if you want to reach out to me, I'm pretty easy to find. I'm Yo Goldsmith on Twitter. I also run the Backstory underscore Mag page on Twitter. And you know, I do the same thing on Instagram. You can find me as Yo Goldsmith on Instagram, or also, of course, the Backstory underscore Mag page on Instagram as well. And uh, look, uh, you can always email me as yo goldsmith at gmail.com. I promise I won't get back to you immediately. I know I always say that. It's because I mean it. Um, but I will do my best. I will do my best. I'm a pretty easy guy to find. I check my Facebook fan page maybe once a week or something like that. I'll try and get better about it. I'm just not on Facebook as much. But look, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.